The Martini Henry had many advantages over its predecessors, the Snyder and the Enfield. Perhaps the most important of these was its ease of use. With just a few movements, the rifle could be loaded, fired, and unloaded with ease. There were no hammers to cock or caps to wrestle with. As a result, the formalized movements to load and fire it, known as the firing exercise, were vastly simpler than they had been with the older weapons. By way of comparison, the Enfield, in service just a few years before, had a comparatively staggering 27 movements to load and fire it. Some of these are seen here in the photographs taken by Roger Fenton of Crimean War fame. The Snyder had nine steps, whilst the Martini had but seven. Not only was this beneficial in teaching the soldier his trade, but it also translated into much more effectiveness on the battlefield. Exemplary of the musketry drills used in the early Martini era are those contained in the manual entitled Rifle and Carbine Exercises, dating from 1879. It contained all facets of the use of the soldier's weapon, the manual exercise, and of course, the firing exercise. Like all practical military skills, it was first taught by numbers. Firing exercise by numbers standing! At 300 yards, ready! Two. Three. Four. In the first part, the soldier made a quarter turn to the right, pivoting on the heels. The weapon, held at the order, rotated with the body. In the second part, the rifle was thrown up so as to be parallel to the ground, with the small of the butt just forward of the right hip. Simultaneous to this, a 12-inch pace was taken with the left foot, placing the feet at right angles. On the word of command 3, the right thumb was placed in the lever of the rifle, forcing it down, thus opening the breech. A cartridge was then withdrawn from the pouch and thumbed into the chamber. The right hand then grasped the lever of the rifle, pulling it up and closing the breech. On the word of command 4, the right hand was moved forward and set the sights to the appropriate setting. The hand was then returned and the weapon held at the ready position. During this era, the word of command present was the executive command to fire. Present! Two! Three! On the word of command present, the rifle was brought to the shoulder, the finger placed on the trigger, and the sights roughly aligned. On the word of command 2, the final adjustments in aim were made, and when ready, the trigger was squeezed. On the word of command 3, the rifle was brought back down to the ready position. The thumb was hooked into the lever, and it was drawn sharply down, ejecting the spent case. The hand was then placed with the thumb on the thumb seat, and the finger on the trigger with the remaining fingers not touching the lever. The trigger was then pressed, which brought the lever up underneath the small of the butt. Its position was confirmed by grasping both the small and the lever with the right hand. Immediately subsequent to this, the right hand was brought forward and returned the sights to their lowest setting. The hands were then brought back to the ready position. Though initially taught from the order, the firing exercise could also be conducted from the shoulder. Firing exercise by numbers standing! At 300 yards, ready! Two. Perhaps more appropriately for field movements, this could also be done from the slope. Firing exercise by numbers standing! At 300 yards, ready! Two. The firing exercise at this time was taught in one other position, the kneeling. Firing exercise by numbers, kneeling! At 300 yards, ready! Two. Three. Four.
In the first part, the man made a quarter turn to the right, pivoting on the heels, much the same as with the standing position. Then, keeping the left foot planted, he drew back the right foot, placing the right knee on the ground, with it pointed straight to the right. The left hand supported the weapon at its point of balance, resting atop the left knee. In the third part, a cartridge was chambered, while in the fourth, the sights were set. These last two parts of the movement were very similar to those from the standing position. The present from the kneeling position was almost the same as that from the standing. Present! The weapon was brought to the shoulder, with the left elbow resting atop the left knee. Two! It was then aimed and fired. Three! The weapon was brought back to the ready position, the casing extracted, and the sights reset. Once these drills were mastered by the numbers, they were then practiced in quick time. Firing exercise! Standing! At 300 yards! Ready! By way of reminder, it's interesting to note that the word fire is not part of this drill. Present! Kneeling in quick time was also practiced. Firing exercise! Kneeling! At 300 yards! Ready! Present! In the event of having to unload an unfired round, the drill was quite simple. Unload! Arms! The thumb was placed in the lever, drawing it down and extracting the unfired round. This was placed back in the pouch. Springs were eased and the ready position reassumed. It goes without saying that the firing exercise, especially when taught and performed by numbers, was a vehicle of instruction used to teach recruits the handling of their weapons. The actual use of the martini on the battlefield was somewhat more efficient. Fire was delivered by volleys or independently, with the unit formed shoulder to shoulder in a two-ranked line, or with its files extended. The image of that two-ranked line pounding volleys at the enemy is rousing in the extreme. But it is important to understand that tactics had evolved past this somewhat Napoleonic technique. It was, however, used as an expedient against poorly armed native enemies. A single rank, with the men spaced three to six paces between them, was the accepted battlefield formation against an enemy armed with similar weapons. It limited the effect of the enemy's fire, while also allowing the Martini's firepower to be developed completely. I suppose the main takeaway from this point is that the image of the British infantry standing two ranks deep, firing volleys at the enemy is not necessarily the most accurate one. This, as mentioned before, was rather an expedient, reverted to out of necessity. Volley fire was used frequently, especially at range, and offered some degree of control. It is noted here, taken from the 1879 manual, that when the word of command present is given, there would be a pause equal to three beats of slow time before firing. This example of volley firing is delivered by two files, four men, in rank entire, acting under the orders of their officer or NCO. Healing fire volley! At 300 yards! Ready! As previously discussed, the word fire does not enter into any part of this drill. Present! The second way to deliver the fire of the Martini Henry was by independent firing, 
This was a two-man evolution, with fire alternating between the front and the rear rank man, whether they were in two ranks or rank entire. Independent fire would typically have been used in more close quarter situations or while skirmishing. It mentions in the manual that the commands to fire and to cease fire would be given on the drum or bugle. It's important, however, to put this in the correct context, in that these are the orders delivered by the company officers or indeed the colonel. While the executive orders to commence firing or to cease firing came directly from the officers or NCOs commanding sections. Two rounds! Independent firing! At 100 yards! Ready! Please excuse the position of these two in this example. The rear rank man should be closed up right behind the front rank, slightly to the right. With some better technology, I'll be able to make a better example. In independent fire, the executive command to fire was the word commence. Commence! Note here that the rear rank man holds his fire in reserve until his front rank man has made ready. Only then does the rear rank man present. The process is then reversed with the front rank man holding his fire until his rear rank man has readied. extended order, it looked like this. When the command of fire was given, the rear rank man moved up to the left of his front rank man. Two rounds! Independent firing! At 100 yards! Ready! Once the line had formed rank entire, or single rank, the executive orders to fire were given by the section officers or NCOs. The front rank man presented first, followed by the rear rank man once the front rank man had readied. February of 1881 heralded a considerable change in the musketry practices of the Army. General Order 15 of that year promulgated a reversion to a word of command not used since the late 1830s. This, of course, was the word of command, fire. This general order made amendments to the 1879 rifle exercises. Apart from a change in the ammunition allowance for the annual qualifications, we see here in paragraph 1 that the word fire was to be introduced into the service generally as an executive word of command in volley firing. The appendix to General Order 15 stipulated the exact way in which this word of command was to be integrated. The firing exercise was essentially unchanged. Only now, instead of the man pausing on his own for three beats of slow time before squeezing the trigger, he would be given the three beats of slow time and then given the command to squeeze the trigger. There was also a stipulation of the way the word of command was to be given, slowly but with decision. This amendment to the firing exercise and musketry in general was formalized with the issue of the Regulations for Musketry Instruction of 1884. Fire a volley at 300 yards! Ready! As you can see from this example, the parts of the firing exercise post-1881 didn't really change much. When standing, there was a pause of three beats of slow time before the word of command fire was given. Present! Fire! Kneeling! Fire a volley! At 300 yards! Ready! 
in the kneeling position, a pause of four beats of slow time was allotted before the word of command fire was given. Present! Fire! Although taught as part of the 1879 musketry instruction for use on the range and other practices, the lying down position wasn't formally introduced into the firing exercise until the 1884 manual. It was taught as a conventional prone position. Firing exercise by numbers, lying down! At 300 yards, ready! In the first part, the customary right half turn was made, simultaneously bringing the rifle to the trail in the right hand. Two! In the second part, the right knee and the left hand were placed on the ground and the body lowered. The rifle was transitioned with the right hand holding the small. Three! The third and the fourth parts were virtually identical to that of the firing exercise from before. The third part saw the rifle chambered, and the fourth the sights set. Four! When volley firing from the lying down position, a pause of six beats of slow time was allotted before the executive fire. Present! Fire! Just the same as in other positions, after a pause the rifle was lowered to the ready position, the casing extracted, and the sights reset. The era of the Martini Henry saw great change in both musketry practices and tactical practices. It allowed for less dense infantry formations on the battlefield due to its increased firepower. This increased dispersion on the battlefield also limited the effect of enemy fire. There were times, though, when confronted with vast, fast-moving native forces, that the old two-rank line without intervals was required. Often this was in conjunction with another somewhat old-fashioned tactic, that of defending from a square. Whether it was in a thin, extended firing line strung across the peaks of some low hills, from behind a barricade, or with nothing more than a bayonet between friend and foe, the Martini Henry and the men who wielded it, using the drills shown here, firmly established themselves and their rifle as the builders and guardians of an empire that stretched across the globe. And remember, dozens of Martini men can't be wrong. For all your Martini brass needs, contact Martin at X-Ring Services. I thought I might close with a mention of the kit used in this video. This is a picture of the 78th Highlanders in the Barrack Square in Kandahar around the year of 1880. Though typically not worn in action in the Indian theatre, the Highland pattern frock in traditional colors figured prominently as the day-to-day -day dress of battalions stationed there. Like the version used by the English line battalions, it was unlined and made of serge. The collar was faced in the regimental facing color, that of the 78th being buff.